gang shit. That's all I'm on. So today we're going to be listening to Joe Rogan and Patrick David from the P- PBD podcast discuss BlackRock. But I'm going to start us off by talking about Aladdin. Aladdin is the software that BlackRock developed and it currently manages $21 trillion of raw money. That's not accounting for the derivatives. So I would say that that number could be multiplied by a factor of 10, possibly 100, which is insane. Um, Aladdin started in 1988's financial software. It was first sold to other companies. BlackRock began to sell Aladdin in 1999. This technology is integral to who we are as a firm and is, and is embedded in everything we do thus differentiating us. Um, This was developed by um, Charles S. Halleck, uh, who took the lead on, uh, I think it's Larry Fink's Fink's, um, brainchild. Um, And uh, it now manages, it, it is an AI. I mean, this, I would say the AI portion of it truly went live in 2003. And this has been managing uh, a bulk of the financial assets in the world because other banks are using Aladdin to manage their assets as well. During the 2008 financial crisis, Aladdin was used to help identify where to spend the trillions of dollars and who who to bail out. This is also potentially why all these banks got caught with their pants down and all had bonds that went negative on their balance sheets because if everybody is operating by the same playbook even though Aladdin is amazing and has been almost unfailable it's only as good as the human intel that it receives so when the Fed is saying interest rates will remain low for two more years and they feed that into Aladdin it gives them an investment mix then the Fed comes out six months later and and decides decides to accelerate interest rate rising because inflation is running hotter than they could tolerate. So then Aladdin failed simply because it was lied to by the humans. But likely this is why you see a lot of banks with the same mixture of assets on their books because they're all using this because it's so good. This is what has made BlackRock the force of nature in this world that it is today. And most people have no clue the extent of what they manage and the power that they have. They are buying U.S. real estate sight unseen because Aladdin has been unleashed on the U.S. housing market and is acquiring assets that will never again be released to citizen homeowners. You will rent, you will own nothing, and you will be happy. This is how they execute that plan. Think Soros, State Street, you know, uh, Vanguard, BlackRock. How much have you looked at what they're doing and how, what their ties are? I've looked at it. Yeah? Yeah. They're pretty much running everything. Yeah. yeah. S&P 500, you know, the number that uh, 88% of the companies on S&P 500, 88% of them, the largest shareholder of those companies is either State Street, BlackRock, or Vanguard. 88% of them, okay? And then you see their influence in defense contracts, okay? So we went through a deal. I'm like, let me see if this, these guys, this ESG, Larry Fink, Vanguard, State Street, if they have any influence on military contract, defense contracts. If you Google the largest shareholder for Raytheon, three out of the four top shareholders of Raytheon, BlackRock, State Street, and uh, Vanguard. It could be top three with Raytheon, but I think it's three out of four. If you go look up General Dynamics, if you go look up Boeing, if you go look up, you know, Northrop Grumman, okay? And then you work backwards and you say, oh. And it's not just about the raw figures here. If they own a, a decent amount of any of these companies, then they also may have the ability to exert some control. So where they are diversely invested, and have large portions of all these giant, giant 
companies. They have their fingers in everything. So you look at Apple and Google and you say, wow, these companies are so big. BlackRock has got fingers in all of these big companies and thus can reach out and be like, hey, you know, we got X number of billion dollars in your company. We don't like this. We don't like that. We'd like this. We'd like that. You know, so it's un it's untold uh, types of influence that you really have to dig into it to really start to understand what these things actually are because they're scary. Okay. How much money is that in, the, uh, in, in what these guys are doing? You'll find uh, uh, our, you know, the amount of money we spent in our military, $744 billion on how much we're making from de- defense. But you'll see some numbers saying last year is 13% of our GDP, which is around $850 billion. That's more than the next 10 combined. We gave more money to Ukraine than Russia spent on their military last year. And when you look at these contracts, then you're like, okay, Fink is there. These guys are there. Okay, let's go look at Hollywood. Same thing you see there. Let's go look at pharmaceutical. Let's go look at this. And you're like, wait a minute. These guys essentially have a monopoly. Well, how big is BlackRock? $10 trillion. How big is $10 trillion? Only two countries have a bigger GDP than what BlackRock has, assets under management, U.S. and China. That's how big big BlackRock is. So then they went and they started getting all these other guys to sign on and say, hey, we want you to participate with the same thing as what with ESG. And they ended up having, I think they had 31 signers, I think end of 2022, they got uh, 60-something signers for a total of $70 trillion of assets under management that they're controlling. So now they're controlling other places. And just recently, if you saw the other day about um, what the, the, the House is actually debating, um, they had a debate about um, access to gender reassignment surgery for children. Um, and, and the debate was, you know, should we allow children to have access to this directly? Um, should we ban access to it? And I think that the government shouldn't even be debating this. They should stay out. It's between the parent, the child, and the doctor. They shouldn't regulate it away so that you don't have access to it, and they shouldn't regulate it so that a child has access to it without parental permission. So that's what they're talking about instead of doing their job, which is to regulate things like this that have real power in the world that can impact your life. It's conveniently ignored. Um, because there's too much money involved. They don't want to jeopardize their their income. You know, they're busy making millions of dollars on top of their $175,000 salary that is paid out of tax dollars. So they have to, um, you know, really make sure that they're serving their true masters. And serving their true masters would not be to give any sort of regulation or oversight to entities like BlackRock and Vanguard that clearly have so much influence and most people don't realize it one of either blackrock vanguard or state street is the largest shareholder in 88 percent of s p 500 companies if you don't know what the s p 500 is it is the list of the largest 500 companies in america that are publicly traded um i'm going to put the links to to this page and I also have some information um, on the details of Aladdin so that it's not just me talking Um, all that stuff will be in the description if you guys want to take a look at that stuff Um, this is I mean there's a lot of stuff going on right now but this is um, something pretty critical that that we should address Um, and and the law, the lawmakers obviously are not going to do it on their own. So uh, the the only way that they're going to even address this is is if we make it a priority instead of arguing about race amongst each other uh, or or gender. Um, you know if you if you care about your your quality of life, um, I don't I don't know how much your gender in today's age. I, I don't know how much your gender or your race versus the decisions you make really impacts your your daily life now the media wants you to think that it's all about the color of your skin but um, there are definitely trailer parks full of white people as well as you know um, 
trailer parks full of black people. It just depends on what part of the country you go to. There are plenty of poor people of all races and genders in this country that are disenfranchised, that do not have equal opportunities to, you know, and access to the things that most of us enjoy. I mean, there are people below the poverty line and, and, and instead we're arguing amongst ourselves about nonsense instead of saying, Hey, how come there's, there's corporations that own 88% of, of the largest companies out there. And this isn't a problem. This is the definition of a monopoly. They're monopolizing the entire system at the market level. Million dollars do it. One point two billion dollars do it. I'm not going to over negotiate the money. They took 51 defense companies, and they brought it down to only five. It's only five companies right now. When you want to buy anything, Th think about that. So defense contractors is five. We know how these guys make money. Earlier, you know, I was asking you a question. Why do you think vaccine? And you're like, Pat, that's how they make their money, right? I mean, if a if you and I run a hotel, rooms are empty. We're not making money. We need people to stay in the rooms. If you and I are running a hospital. We need people on the beds to make money. Yeah. If there's no people on the beds, we ain't making money. If these five contractors are fighting for $744 billion, what do they want more of? Wars. They want more people dying. You know the Papa John saying, better ingredients, better pizza, Papa John's. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys is more wars, more people dying, more profits, defense contractors, right? That's a valid concern that I have. Because yeah. behind closed doors, this whole military-industrial complex, when you look at the numbers... Who There's a reason that we keep re-entering wars and staying in wars. It is literally vital to our economy um, to be dropping $25 million missiles and, and, and producing um, you know, $100 million drones. I mean, the amount of money that's thrown around, th this is... A large part of what stimulates our economy when your regular main street people don't only control 10 10 of the wealth 90 percent of the country 10 percent of the wealth so we don't even have the capacity to move the needle the only people that can move the needle is the 10 percent or less that own 90 percent of the wealth and and you know you are talking about corporate entities and people who are able to move the needle in the market in the economy and uh, when you start you know churning out hundred billion dollar or hundred million dollar drones and 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 these missile systems and all this stuff that's that's what really gets our economy going so we don't have good industry outside building bombs that's that's our, our primary export is war that's why we keep going back to it we need it um, and the only way to prevent that is to fundamentally change the way that the economy and the system works in this country and shift away from the military industrial complex that Roosevelt warned us about continuing down this path and lo and behold he was very sage in his advice and and all the bad things that he speculated about um, where the the industry of war would grab this country by its tail and and now you've got the you know the dog's not wagging its tail anymore whoever becomes the president unfortunately this guy's an anti-establishment president good unfortunately if you're an anti-establishment president everyone's going to come after you especially these military defense contractors mm -hmm. so if a president got up and said if i'm going to be the president here's what we're going to be doing People don't want to hear this, but this is why part of the reason that people hate Trump so much. He does not want us to be in wars. He's a nationalist. He wants to have borders. And he wants to bring the troops home. The the That is not the American agenda. The American agenda is to continue to, to stay overseas. And, I mean, clearly, what happened when Biden got in? You know, how long were we really out of war? Barely any time at all. We That messy with Afghanistan withdrawal where we basically gifted that country more military assets than the like the Taliban had more uh, Black Hawk helicopters than England the UK when we pulled out we left them all kinds of military hardware who cares China's in there making deals for the lithium mines a couple days after we're gone um, the school shut down all our progress gone and we gave our enemy supposedly if you believe the narrative 
our enemy, we gave them all that military hardware and turned them into a pretty legitimate military power if they learn how to use it. Um, it's uh, And then we go right into the Russia-Ukraine thing, you know, almost um, immediately. So we need, it's, it's I don't know. I, uh, we kind of pushed Russia into invading, and it's like, perfect, back to war, great. I mean, they, they love it. We have to look at all the contracts. You can't overcharge us. We have to open it up. You have to sell some of your companies. You have to let them be independent again. You have to do this. You have to let them go public, separate, whatever way you got to break them apart to have competition again, because we don't have that today. You know, so that is a major concern where we say we have a commander in chief, but really the commander in chief is Larry Fink today. The guy running BlackRock is really the president of the United States if we look at the kind of influence he's got in every industry, Joe. And he's like, well, you know, I kind of feel bad. I'm ashamed that all the weaponization, the word, you know, ESG is being used and all this other stuff. And Elon tweeted about the ESG. I don't know if you remember when Elon tweeted about ESG, saying the S in ESG is satanic. Okay? So this is a part where even a Charlie Munger, who is Warren Buffett's partner, says, look, I love Larry Fink, but I'm not interested in having an emperor. Some words like that he said about Larry Fink. So th this motive, and by the way, Larry Fink is an interesting guy because he majored in college political science. His aspirations was politics. He accidentally got into money, and he learned to trade, and then he lost $100 million at, at 36 years old, I think, and then he teams up with Schwartzman, and they start this company, and after a couple years, they got $5 billion under management, $8 billion, and $32 billion. And then they have a difference because, you know, he wants to give equity and Jamie's, you know, Schwartzman's like, no, and then they separate. But influence of politics, you get into business, you're a billionaire. It's you, Soros. So I'm, I'm extremely concerned about what these guys are up to. And we think our president is the most powerful person. That person's not. Because behind closers closers are going to be like, look. Guys, let's relax. That guy's only going to be there for four to eight years. We're going to be all right. He'll be out. We're running the world. We're okay. We were running America, but now we're running the world. We control all the ETFs in America. We're controlling all this stuff. Everyone has to come through us, and we can tell everybody what to do because everybody fears not getting money from us, from being downgraded. A Tesla on ESG score is nothing, but a Philip Morris gets an A rating. How the hell the company that's Philip Morris has a better environmental social governance score, DEI, you know, not DEI, but the CEI the, uh, score, they give it over Tesla. So th they can bully some of these guys. Well, now, let me ask you this. What do you think the goal of ESG is? What, why do you think they're establishing these sort of parameters? Like why? Since they're not explaining ESG, an ESG score is a way to assign a quantitative metric such as a numerical score or letter rating to the environmental, social, and government's ESG efforts undertaken by a specific organization. So this is like a social credit score for, uh, for a company. It's not just the amount of money they make. Now you're considering, oh, are they woke? Are they paying, are they caring for the environment? And what groups are they giving preference to? Are they, you know, just letting the free market work it out or are they structuring themselves to align with some sort of you know communist equality ideals and so this companies are trying to get their ESG scores up so this is why some of their virtue signaling behavior and all this crap exists is I'm trying to boost my score you know I why is ESG a thing and what's the benefit of it for them so Schultz said something very interesting. Schultz says, look, these guys are driven by money. They're not going to do anything to destroy an economy to lose their own money because right. they want that. I said, okay, so very good. Andrew Schultz, I said, that's right. a very good point uh, of, you know, on, on what you're saying. Fine. So, you know, you know how sometimes Michael Jackson, you see the interview with him with kids. Oh, they're just sleeping in the bed. That's all it is. And we're just having a great time and we're storytelling. And like, yeah, bro, I get it. You know, it's a little weird. You got a seven, eight year old, 10 year old kid sleeping in your bed and, you know, all this stuff. And just, it's a little bit fishy what you're talking about here. It it's incredibly relevant to the conversations today about sound of freedom and 
the media saying that it's all QAnon conspiracies, even after Jeffrey Epstein's fuck island was discovered, and we know who was on the jets and who was at the townhouse, and there's no official list out of of the the sex offender criminal pedophiles, but I mean, I would just assume that that anybody who's flying to the island with him or uh, stays in his townhome, the the amount of cameras that were in those residences, um, obviously he's recording everybody. Anybody who came over and did anything with any of the girls that were surrounding him probably were compromised immediately because most of the girls were underage. He had hundreds of girls down in Florida who were coming over and giving him massages for $200 performing sex acts. If they weren't willing to perform sex acts, he would give them $200 to bring their friends and they wouldn't tell their friends, so they put their friends in that same situation that friends in the same situation that they didn't want to participate in. And um, then it seems like the the girls that were really willing and compliant, at, they were being groomed or selected for the island, where the real crazy stuff would go on. So, you know, I mean, they they try to like turn, tone it down. Oh, this isn't really going on. We know it's going on. You're lying to us. Um, the same thing. Everybody knew that this was weird with Michael Jackson, but I guess his music's so good that people don't care that he was molested. Uh, people who are molested are very likely to pass it on. So likely he was passing on the 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 trauma that he experienced as a child to even more children and he had the money to convince parents to leave their kids over there and and the amusement park um and animals to lure them in and it was like a perfect little pedophile trap that he had set up but you know to this day michael jackson is a saint somehow when he's definitely not it's not normal well, if you're in Hollywood and you've slept with as many people as these people sleep and then eventually you have to have other options because what else do you do? You have to try new things. How many threesomes have you had? How many this? How many that? So you start trying all these other things and sometimes these guys go to such and such place. doesn't matter. It's kind of weird and fishy, right, on what you want to do. Great. Okay. So why are these guys doing what they're doing? You have all the money in the world. You live in a $100 million house, not you, Larry Fink and some of these guys. You, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know if he lives in a $100 million house, right, but you got the money to live yeah. in a $100 million. What else do you need? Right. You got nice cars. Jamie Dimon's got a $900 million art collection, according to an article. It's a nice art collection, right? You go to all the nice restaurants. You meet prime ministers. You meet presidents. And then maybe there comes a time when you're looking at a couple of these guys, they're presidents and prime ministers, and you tell yourself, I'd be a better president than you, bro. How the hell am I not reading the country? Or they tell themselves, you think you're a president? You're not a president. You work for me. What else is the motive? But ESG, how does that factor into But that? That the point is control is what I'm saying. So the motive okay. becomes control more than money. After you have all the money in the world, what's next? Without ESG, financials, you can only dictate one dimension of a company's behavior. Profit. That's it. They're going to behave according to what is most profitable. ESG gives you three-dimensionality and allows you to say, what about your social? And we keep, we keep the financial metric, but now we add a social metric and we add an environmental metric. And now we have a way of really poking and prodding you into shifting yourself right where we want you to get that score where it needs to be. And if you don't comply, you know, we'll just, uh, we'll do what the, the U.S. playbook is to sanction, you know, economic punishment instead of going to war. Same playbooks used in the corporate world. Punish companies. Anyone who sticks their head up, punish them. Smash them down. It's got to be control or a true vision. So a Soros, when you're talking ESG, that story is a completely different story. You ever heard Soros' interview with... 60 minutes where he says, I see myself as a God. Have you ever seen this uh, interview or, or I, what he says? No. Really? He said oh. he sees himself as a God. Oh, my God. Uh, 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 Jamie, do you mind pulling up the quote? I think it's if you type in L.A. Times Soros God. If you type in L.A. Times Soros God, when you hear what he says, 
It's like the second to the last paragraph all the way to the bottom. The guy asks a question, you know, about who he views himself as. I want to I want to quote it properly exactly what he says. In this Is there interview. a video of him saying Yeah, this? 60 minutes. There's a video as well. So if you go all the way to the bottom, go a little bit higher, go a little bit higher on the quote. No, go a little higher. I think it's a little higher. I'm kind of... It seems that Soros believes he was anointed by God. I fancied myself as some so sort of God, he once wrote. If truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood, which I felt I had to control, otherwise they might get me in trouble. Put the link to this article in there, in the description as well. That's insane. So, original self center, keep going higher. Sort of a demonstration. Keep going higher. Keep going higher. Keep going higher. Prevail values. A little higher. A little higher. There's a part where he says, uh, "Keep going." What year is this article, by the way? Is this an? It's a. It's an all, old article. It's supposed it's over to be. Two thousand four. That's the one. This is the one. Uh, right there. Okay. Right there. It seems that Soros believes he was anointed, anointed by God. I fancied myself as some kind of a god. If truth be known, I carried some rather potent messianic fantasies with me from childhood, which I felt I had to control. Otherwise, they might get me in trouble. And then on the next line, when asked by Britain's independent newspaper to elaborate on the passage, Soros says, it is sort of a disease when you consider yourself some kind of a god the creator of everything, but I feel comfortable about it now since I began to live it out. What a psycho. Yeah, but I get it. You know, it's a little weird. You got So um, I hope that was enlightening. I, I don't know if I've really got much more to add. Um, it's a beautiful encapsulation of a huge problem that's facing America. I'm just trying to give it more exposure. Um, you know, I wish Joe Rogan was still on um youtube but i'm gonna be probably doing some reactions to full-length episodes at some point um i know people including myself love to watch rogan so um i want to i'm going to be part of some of his conversations unwillingly you know you know the creepy guy that you don't want around and he just shows up and he's like hey what's up i'm here too that's gonna be me on the internet so look forward to that I'll see you guys soon. Love you. I'm not suicidal. I would never kill myself.